I'm Chris Dutchko, co-host of the Ninth Grade Experience Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hey, welcome back. Steve here. And today I'm talking with Catherine Marsh and we are focused on her middle grades novel, The Lost Year. Awesome story. Awesome conversation. So much cool stuff to learn. Thanks for listening. And then by the way, before you go, it'd be so cool if you went to my website, stephenmoletto.com slash reviews and left a review. Could you do that for me? That would be awesome. And then while you're there, check out all the other good stuff I got on my uh, on my website. Uh, by the way, the other way you can do this is you can go on the Apple podcast that you're listening to me on or, or uh, whatever other platform and go in there just below the podcast artwork. If you scroll down just a little bit on your phone, you'll notice there's a place there where you could leave five stars and uh, some nice comments. What do you think? Could you do that for me? Thanks so much. You are awesome. Enjoy the show. It's the Education Podcast, your favorite show. With lots of groovy guests and they share what they know. So crank it up to 10 and let your neighbors know that here's another show with Dr. Steve Milletto. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Ah, ah, with Dr. Steve Milletto. Catherine Marsh is an award-winning author of novels for middle-grade readers, including The Lost Year, Nowhere Boy, winner of the Middle East Book Award, The Night Tourist, winner of the Edgar Award for Best Juvenile Mystery, Jep, Who Defied the Stars, a New York Times notable, and The Door by the Staircase, a junior library guild selection. Catherine grew up in Yonkers, New York, in the home of her Ukrainian grandma who taught her to love stories and borscht. A former jur- journalist and managing editor of the New Republic, Catherine lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband, two children, and an astonishing array of pets. Catherine, thanks so much for joining me today, and say hi to everyone. Yes, hi, and thank you for having me, Steve. Oh, I'm glad to have you here, and I know I didn't say this ahead of time because I, for some reason it, it skipped my mind, but so how do you how do you like that borscht? I, I, oh, I, I love borscht, and I make a good one myself, too. Awesome. I have, as a former principal in school with very international uh, uh, student body, I've I've had many different versions of it, and so I, so it was good. It was good, but uh, it's so cool stuff. Uh, so, Catherine, uh, could you share your story about why you focused on becoming a writer? Absolutely. So I, uh, as you mentioned, grew up in Yonkers, New York, in the home of my Ukrainian grandmother, and we moved in with her when I was five years old. Um, and she was just like a second mother to me. And she had grown up in Ukraine and come to this country when she was about 21. Um, and so she didn't have much of an education. She'd only gone to school for four winters, um, which is not even four years. Um, but she was a wonderful storyteller. And when I go and meet kids in classrooms, I always ask them if they have someone in their life who's a good storyteller. Um, And it has nothing to do with your education or background. um, But I find that almost every kid will say there's somebody who can really tell a good story. And that was my grandma. Um, So in addition to her telling me lots of stories about her childhood in uh, in Ukraine, I also loved to read as a child. Um, And that combination of those two things really sort of drove me toward wanting to write myself. Um, And I got into journalism first. I was actually a teacher. That was my first job. I taught ninth and 12th grade English. Um, And then I uh, became a journalist. And then my grandmother passed away when I was about 25. And I really, that was a hard loss for me. And I think I grappled with some of those feelings of sadness and despair um, by writing and I started to write a story for young people because you know she had been such a formative figure in my life um, that was set in New York City and it was about a boy looking for his mother um, in the uh, Greek mythological underworld except it was a version of it that was in Manhattan um, <laughs> so that's how I got started in writing for young people that's awesome that's cool it's a it's a neat neat transition it's always cool how people uh, make a shift or or just choose to to do it because it's uh, I would think it has to there has to be some um, love from the heart coming through those words and stuff like that so I don't know <laughs> yes absolutely very cool so uh, all right so the lost year which is what we're going to be focused on here in a minute it, the lost year is written in a unique manner and you're trying to solve the mystery as the main character is doing the same right why did you write this way what, what made you say I'm going to do this 
Well, I am an Edgar Award winner, which means I won the Edgar, which is the Mystery Writing Award. And I love mysteries. And I think it's a natural way to sort of pull young readers, especially, but older ones as well, into a story. And so I knew from the beginning that I wanted there to be a family mystery um, and that I thought it would be this, this is tough material for young people. Let me just say that is that talking about Ukrainian history, talking about this famine, um, talking about a totalitarian government. Um, those are for sort of difficult, very difficult historical issues. And I always feel like you have to have a little bit of honey with everything you do, especially when it's a tough subject. And that honey for me was creating a really um, sort of suspenseful, exciting mystery that you want to solve as a reader. So even if you don't know anything about Ukraine, which I started writing this book before, uh, you know, the big invasion of Russia um, last year into Ukraine. And I assumed that kids in America wouldn't know much about Ukraine. Um, You know, when I started there, I knew that I wanted to still have this sort of Uh, this sense of detective work that you had to do as a reader that would be sort of fun for kids. So even if they didn't care about some of the bigger issues, they would care about Matthew, the main character, who's just trying to solve a mystery about his great grandmother um, and what happened to her. That's awesome. And and it's one of the things that I I think one of the things that's a cool side uh, note to your to writing like this and telling this type of story is I would hope that it creates a curiosity in a child to ask their own grandparents some questions. So. Yes, I, I really truly hope so. And, you know, one of the things that I think is great is, is the intergenerational relationship in this book, because it really is about in the beginning of the book, Matthew and his great grandmother don't have much in common. I mean, she is, a hundred years old. She's not in the best of shape. He's 13. Um, and like many young people, he doesn't really see her as a full person, but as an old person. Um, and that changes in this throughout this course of the story. And I think it's a really great sort of ride for kids to go on where they also realize that maybe some of the older people in their life have lived through really interesting and, and difficult times and have some stories for them. It's awesome, and it's really well written that way. And as somebody who was uh, like the best buddy of his two different grandfathers, um, the uh, my grandmothers were the rule makers. <laughs> the uh, um, whereas, you know, basically, my grandfathers got in trouble, and I don't know if they used me as an excuse to get in trouble <laughs> or or what. But uh, um, but uh, as someone who uh, had that type of connection with uh, grandparents. It's uh, it's cool to to have it have you write a story that uh, might inspire them to yeah see them beyond being that older person who who tells them stories once in a while. Yes, yeah, no, that's my hope. And my grandmother and I had a really fun relationship, and she was. And I think this can also be part of that dynamic: is that a grandparent is not your parent, so they can be a little bit more free with you and and tell you things um, that maybe your parents won't. And my grandmother was certainly like that. And she was also great at sort of giving me, you know, contraband candy and letting me watch junkie nice. TV in her room and <laughs> nice. teaching me how to play poker too. So. Oh, very nice. Very nice. That's <laughs> awesome. That's, that's exactly the type of things that's, that's really cool because just like you said, they're not your parents. So they have like an extra license, the license to, uh, you know, to spoil or to, uh, you know, whatever you want to, exactly. whatever you want to call it. And, uh, that, that's funny. Cause that's, uh, that's pretty cool. And that's the type of thing that I was um, leaning towards there with my grandfathers because they do things like, you know, like my one grandfather showed me how to take a walkie talkie and stick that metal antenna against the type of antenna that ran down the house that was on top of the TV. This is before cable. Okay. I'm dating myself, but you could make the walkie talkie come across the TV set in the room by doing that. And so we're outside talking and he tried to claim innocence afterwards, but 
his voice was too familiar. (laughs) Yeah, my grandmother used to take the blame for me when my mother was like, where did you get that candy? And my grandma, I I sometimes would take it. And my grandma would say, oh, I gave it to her. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Protection. That's the force field there. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. But I think it's also interesting when you grow up with a grandparent who is an immigrant. Um, And three out of my four grandparents were immigrants. Um, And so that was also another part of my life is that you feel that there's this whole existence for your family in a different country and across an incredibly difficult period of history because the 20th century in Eastern Europe was a very bloody century. So it was also my sort of introduction to the world outside of the U.S. What an incredible introduction too, and to have the opportunities to learn um, a lot about, about it or however you take it in um, to make sure you take advantage of that. So that's just huge part of your your story and um your story not just your story that you tell in the book so awesome i you know let's so before we go any further let's talk a little bit about history um because that's a big part of uh what's going on in your book here is this reality that took place so what i'd like you to do is talk a little bit about who joseph stalin was and could you also share a little bit about that their societal program he had called collectivization and uh Tell us who the Kulaks were. Absolutely. So these are these are some of the things that a young reader would learn through the book. You don't have to come to the book with this knowledge, but it's helpful in discussing it. Um, so the Soviet Union, um, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union as of 1922. Um, and Joseph Stalin was the second leader of the Soviet Union after uh, Lenin. And Stalin definitely was the most brutal of the Soviet leaders, I think, you know, pretty arguably was the most brutal. Um, And when he took over, he decided that he wanted to collectivize, um, which is basically a term that means he didn't want farmers um, and landowners to have private property, but to give that property up to the state to form collective farms. And one of the most important things to understand about Ukraine is it's the breadbasket of that area. It is where there's this wonderful black earth. My grandmother used to always talk about it and complain about how much, uh, you know, poor the soil was in New York compared to her childhood. Um, But that black earth grew a lot of the grain. And so there were a lot of farms in Ukraine. There were a lot of independent farmers. And Stalin was really worried about their resistance. Um, And so collectivization was also a way to control Um, you know, the people there so that they couldn't have their own sort of, you know, financial independence. So collectivization was a difficult time for a lot of Ukrainians. Um, Those who resisted were sometimes, you know, sent on trains to Siberia. Um, They were punished. Um, They were forced into this. Um, And after that occurred, um, and, and, and particularly the peasants that were the most affected by this were known as kulaks, and they were the upper sort of middle class peasants, the ones that owned some land. Um, and they were the ones that Stalin, I think, really worried about, uh, you know, trying to be independent from him. Um, and so Stalin collectivized both to try to uh exert control over Ukraine. Um, And he also wanted to industrialize the Soviet Union. And in order to do that, he built a lot of factories. A lot of them were in Russia. And so he exported a lot of that grain out of Soviet Ukraine into Russia. Um, And that is sort of the basis, the historical basis of the famine that I wrote about in this book, which took place between 1932-33. Um, it took place, you know, several years after collectivization, sort of toward the end of that. Um, but this was sort of the um, an important step for Stalin in exerting his control over Ukraine. Um, and the starvation that resulted killed millions of Ukrainians, including men, women, and children. And it really left a huge sort of a huge imprint on the people. Um, And 
I had heard about this because my grandmother had left behind her two sisters and a brother, um, and they never came to this country. She had one brother who did come before her. Um, but she also had a cousin who joined her here in 1933 um, and who had lived through this. And she used to describe, she didn't talk about it very much, but she, when she did, she used to tell a story about her village in wintertime that year of 32, 33, that winter, and how it was absolutely silent, which was very unusual because in the old days in a farm village, you would hear cows and you'd hear horses and you'd hear dogs and you'd hear cats. Um, but in, in, the, in this case, all the animals, even pets, had been eaten by starving villagers. So it was absolutely quiet. Um, so this was a really powerful story. And I remember hearing that and yet nobody knowing that this had happened. Like if you talk to other Americans, nobody knew that all these millions of Ukrainians had starved. And I was really interested in in, in writing about that because it's we're in an era now where we're looking at a lot of these histories um, that have been suppressed, um, that, you know, haven't been told. And I thought this is a pretty important one. Um, so that's why I decided to write The Lost Year. I appreciate you sharing. And, you know, and just to make sure that uh, in that event that you share in The Lost Year with this starvation and such, it's called the, the Holodomor? Holodomor, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah that's uh, um, it's, it's just unbelievable what people can do to people. And uh, to uh, sh- um, to put that as part of your story is uh, good to bring out. Uh, hopefully, make a ch- kid ask questions. So, um, yes, yeah. I also felt it was an important story to tell because Stalin really was able to get away with doing this, and and he did suppress that it was happening, and he used sort of fake news and propaganda, which are terms that we use a lot today in our discussions about you know not only about Russia um, but about you know, this country as well. Um, But he also created a very um, strong sense of there being good guys and bad guys, Um, us versus them thinking. And I was really interested in writing about that as well, because I've seen, you know, I feel we've had currents of that in this country over the past, you know, several years. Um, And it's important to look at the dangers of that kind of thinking. And he really took it to an extreme. I can definitely sp- split a people to the point where they ignore what's right before them, their eyes. And just as a note, it's some of what uh, um, Russian propaganda that has been used to explain that, no, it's not our fault at whatsoever. We're just taking care of a problem. And uh, you know, that's pretty much how it's um, laid out from that side. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I mean, what's what's amazing is that, you know, I wrote the book and I started in 2019. I finished it right before Russia invaded last February, um, you know, of uh, 2022. And so many historical parallels just came to light. You know, there 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 are a number of them. And one of them is definitely the use of propaganda um, by Russia. Another one is the politicization of, of food. Um, and we see that now with Russia also trying to control Ukraine's grain. Um, and so the, and, and then also with this sort of use of young people, um, you know, trying to get young people um, into Russia who are Ukrainian and kind of reprogramming them and things like that, that are very familiar. And if you understand this time in history, if you understand what Stalin did in Ukraine, you can definitely understand what's going on today a little better. You are so right. You're so right. And it's, it's an incredible backdrop for your story. And, uh, you know, I got to talk about how you write. You write in a manner that creates an emotional response. And I'm going to read something from your story. For example, hey, Gigi, I said, I said it's you. Who, who's Helen? Her blue-gray eyes became watery. She started blinking fast, but a tear escaped and ran down her cheek. Watching her reminded me of Dad tearing up after I'd lost it and started bawling when he told me he'd taken the Paris job. If you ask me, a grown-up crying is way worse than a kid full-out losing it. I didn't know what to say, but I, I felt I had to say something. Are you okay? I asked, feeling stupid because she obviously wasn't. She swiped at her eyes, but tears were running down her face. She shoved the photo into my hand. Put it away. Could you talk about writing to make your readers feel the emotions of the characters? Because you do a good job of it. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
I mean, that was something that, again, I feel like the storytelling in my household growing up was always very emotional. Um, you know, I, I think the the background I came from, people, you know, were openly emotional. Um, and so it's something that I always strive to do with story because I think that's how we understand um that's how we understand each other is through, um, you know, the way that we create emotional reactions through the narrative. And so for me, when I write, I think a lot about how to elicit that emotional response in a reader and how to use the kind of details that, you know, bring emotion alive, because I think that that's, that is what we crave. Um, and it's interesting, Steve, I just did a piece for the Atlantic about kids and reading. Um, and in that piece, I talk a lot about story. And one of my concerns with the way the education system has developed over the last 20 years is that there's been more focus on, um, you know, both on testing and on, um, on analytic kind of, you know, testing analytic uh, abilities. Um, and because of that, a lot of times kids are ending up doing um, analysis of a single paragraph and not always reading the whole book. And I feel like it's really important to start to create that foundation for the love of reading and for story is to let them like meet characters, let them feel emotional about a book, let them get those connections that are kind of relational and all of that. Um, so I think that that's, you know, to me, those are really that that's something that I value in my writing. And I try to create an engagement between the reader um, and, you know, in the material, um, because I feel like that's how kids fall in love with reading and reading has to be as vivid and as connective and as emotional as everything else they do as movies and video games and you know all these other things and i i know i'm competing against that when i write um so i try to sort of you know create a sense of suspense and of emotion and of connective sort of tissue like that that's cool because you do it. You do a great job, and it's uh, and you kind of go the gambit. So you kind of feel all you have to do is have been up, you know, know that something's upset somebody. All you have to do is know that feeling, and you feel that that sort of tension, and you feel the the, the pursuing the mystery and all that sort of stuff. And it's uh, I I love it. It's uh, gets your attention. So you know, one of the techniques that you use in your storytelling is switching between time frames. All right, how difficult is it to do that? It is it is tricky. I mean, that's something that I have to think about in terms of when I plot plot, you know, you if you're going to do that, you need to leave readers in an exciting place um, in order to buy the time to sort of switch to another place. So it is something but it's partly what I enjoy. And my background in journalism is in narrative editing. So I've always worked on kind of longer magazine um, length pieces that have kind of this sense of, you know, almost being a puzzle. And I love puzzles. Um, <laughs> I love puzzles of all sorts. And so I do try to sort of think about how I'm going to fit the pieces together. And as you know, and you will not hopefully say there is a big spoiler in this book um, <laughs> that I, you know, I very carefully constructed. Um, it, it's a puzzle book in some ways, and it is meant to kind of surprise the reader. Um, so that is something that, you know, is, is all part of the adventure of reading the book. <laughs> oh, but of course, I'm not going to spoil any of the thing like that. There's no way. Cause right. that's, a, <laughs> that's the cool thing, especially if you, anyone who likes to read mysteries or, or thrillers or anything like that, you got to have, <laughs> Oh no, 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 I will not. <laughs> I do not good, do that. Good. So we're good there. <laughs> I, you know, one of the, uh, one of the issues that is, uh, you know, part of the story is understanding what is reliable information, you know, what, or what's reliable source of information. I mean, could you talk about this as an issue that is just as relevant yeah. today as it was then? Absolutely. So this was one of the things that really fascinated me about the story of the whole of the war was not only the suppression of Stalin so that most, most people in the Soviet union, a lot of people outside the affected areas, um, which also included Kazakhstan um, as well as Ukraine and some other areas that were affected, but people outside those areas didn't really know what was happening um, because there was, you know, basically suppression and, you know, any, any breath of this was considered fake news. Um, but 
the international response fascinated me because of a particular reporter, and his name was Walter Durante, and he was the Moscow correspondent for the New York Times. Um, and he reported from Moscow and very much enjoyed the perks that he got from the Soviet government and often used the government as a, as a sole source, which he did in the case of this famine. Um, and he denied that it was happening. He basically took the party line and he said, you know, the, the the famous headline was Russians are hungry, but not starving. And that created a sense in the international press as well that this wasn't happening. And I was really fascinated about that story, um, also because there were some journalists who actually were able to get out of Moscow, took the initiative to get down there um, and to actually speak with people and learn that there was indeed mass death going on and mass starvation leading to, to death. Um, and so I was really interested in that as a journalist, that particular story, because we talk about disinformation now as something that's like a sort of, you know, kids understand the term. Um, they're often taught about media literacy. Um, but we don't understand the sort of historical piece of that, which is that this has happened and it's shaped the way that we understand history. And what I love about this example when I talk to young people is you can see how this reporting, um, you know, this this dis misinformation uh, that Walter Dranty was reporting really shapes sort of the knowledge going forward of the whole of the more outside of uh, outside of the Soviet Union, which is very little. And so when I said to you earlier about how when I was younger and I would hear about this and then nobody else seemed to know about it, you can trace that back in part to this, you know, this article. So it really gives young people a sense of how important it is um, to, you know, get multi-source journalism, for example, to make sure that even when somebody is, you know, has a big title like Walter Durante did, he'd won a Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize. So that's a big thing. But you have to still look at how people are doing their reporting um, and, and look at critically, you know, engage with information. Um, so for me, it's just a wonderful case study in this issue of disinformation. And, and it's so incredible that you're addressing that because that's one of the things that I'm, I'm a former history teacher and I have a couple of degrees in history and um, really big into researching the time frame of, uh, uh, of the, from the late 1800s into the thirties and fifties of, uh, um, of the U S and, uh, but one of the things that's amazing to me about the time frames was how isolated people were from information. And so it was easy to mm -hmm. just feed them what you wanted to. The irony of it all is that we have way more access to information today than we ever did. And we're just as gullible today <laughs> as we were then. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Right. I mean, today it's like a fire hose of information that you're getting and right. it's, it's learning to kind of root through that and decide what is accurate. And that's something I love talking to kids about. And there are wonderful organizations who do that now who try to, you know, create media literacy. And what I find when I visited kids, you know, this go around, and I've been doing this every few years as I have a book out, is that most kids are not even getting their, I mean, most kids get their news from social media. Um, and I had an interesting example of that where I asked some kids, um, you know, I'll just say that they're in New England, if they read their local paper and I named it, or if they get their news from uh, social media. And not only did the most of them say social media, but several of them said, what? I've never heard of that. You know, and they meant the, mentioned the paper by name. I've never heard of that. Like, is that, a you know, so so it's a different age. Um, but the issues remain the same. The issues of sort of asking where your information is from. How is it getting there? You know, can you trust it? Um, you know, is somebody trying to give you information to make you think in a certain way? And how do you figure that out? These are all really relevant questions today. Um, and I think you can find a really interesting sort of historical way to talk about them, too, to give it historical context through the example of of the Holodomor in this book. Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. The, you know, one of the things that uh, you've kind of touched on a little bit that I want to make sure that we chit chat about before you go is... I mean, do you think that it's important to understand past histories between Ukraine and Russia in order to understand why others should care about current events between these two countries? 
Absolutely. I mean, I have a very complicated background in that my grandmother was from Ukraine. My grandfather, her husband, was from Belarus. Um, and my father's side of the family were from, you know, the pale. They were actually Jewish. My mother's family were not. They were Eastern Orthodox um, Christian. And so I have a lot of different um, identifications with that area and 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 a whole lot of really dark, difficult history. Um, I even have Polish, some Polish, too, on my grandmother's side and my grandfather's side. So there's a whole lot of different histories there. But I do think it's incredibly important to to look at the sort of the history of the Soviet Union, of the Russian Empire, um, you know, to look at the history of Ukraine. There's a very good book by uh, Serhii Plochi, who is a professor at Harvard that I, I really enjoyed that sort of goes and it's called The Gates of Europe that talks about Ukraine's history, because for a long time, the Soviet Union students of Russia often saw this from the perspective of the Kremlin. And so some of these other um, you know, republics were not getting their own kind of look in terms of what their history has been from their perspective. So I think it's really important to do that now. And especially with, you know, Russia's, um, you know, violation of Ukrainian sovereignty, I think it's really important to understand how these, um, you know, these countries and these cultures have interacted with each other. And there have been a lot of connections, but there's also been, you know, a lot of um, subjugation as well. And so I, I think it's 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 absolutely important. And the more we can get into the complexity of that, I think the better it is um, for young people in terms of understanding the world and and, you know, understanding these conflicts. Oh, so right. So right. Uh, it, you know, if you had a chance to talk with a room full of teachers you know, who are interested in learning about creating engaging opportunities for students in their classrooms using your book, The Lost Year, what would you share with them? Well, we have a wonderful teacher's guide um, that was uh, created by a group of um, educators and also with the help of a professor who is herself Ukrainian who teaches at Cambridge, um, who was really helpful to me when I wrote the book. I used a lot of historians as readers. I had several of them um, read, help me with details and really nitty gritty ones. Like there's some, there's a, uh, as you probably know from the book, um, there's a chocolate, a Soviet chocolate that plays a very big role in the story. And I, I really spent a lot of time um, making sure that that chocolate was kind of accurately represented and translated even. Um, and so I think it's, 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 you know, really important um to get all of those sort of details but now i've lost i'm going to stop for a second because now i've lost the train of the question because no um oh yes teachers okay so start over there so i was going to say for educators um the teacher's guide for me is a really great um way to sort of get into this book because not only does it give you thumbnails of all these terms that you can learn through the book but it's nice to also have definitions of collectivization and kulak um but one of the exercises that i absolutely love is this what they call the keeper the story keeper the keeper of the story exercise and Matthew, the 13-year-old protagonist of the book, um, who is stuck at home in COVID with his great-grandmother and plays Zelda all the time, right? He's like your, your typical kid on his Nintendo Switch all day long, like my own kids were during the <laughs> pandemic often. <laughs> um, but he gets drawn into this mystery about his great-grandmother, and we go back in time and we learn about her and her her two cousins um, and this single family and how the Holodomor um, affected them. Um but basically, Matthew, in hearing all of this, actually becomes an active listener. And, you know, there's a role for him in helping his great grandmother deal with trauma. And that very much is what this book is about. And I chose to set it partly during the pandemic because of the trauma of that for everyone. And it's a trauma I think we like to turn away from, especially now. Nobody wants to talk about it, but I think it's had an, a outsized impact that we're only going to sort of be, we're only beginning to discover. Um, and I think that, that 
the exercise that I love is asking kids to do what Matthew does and find a family story, find somebody in their family to share a story. Doesn't have to be as dramatic as Matthew's great grandmother's, um, but something that they can record and to actually be the keeper of the story is um, having a young person write uh, about someone's story in their family and to actually do some of that research that Matthew ends up sort of doing along with his grandmother, which Matthew ends up looking at photographs and primary documents um, and news stories. He gets on Google and he like looks stuff up and to do all of that and then to go through the writing process and write that story down um, is something that I think is a great thing for kids to do. I think every kid should do that. Um, and it's a way to kind of both learn a little bit about reporting and journalism. This is a nonfiction exercise. It's a way to learn to listen to someone else. Um, and it's also a way to kind of work on your own writing, which I think is something that, you know, we've talked a little bit about reading and writing and they have been negatively impacted by the pandemic. And I think it's great to get kids doing this, but you have to meet them where they're at and you have to make it emotionally interesting. And that's sort of what I think is really important and really also fun about this kind of exercise is that you can write about somebody in your life, and make it personal. I love that. And and just a note, that teacher guide is really cool too. And, you know, talk about an invaluable resource that you've provided. <laughs> I got to, I got to, that's, that. I, I got to make sure that, you know, any teacher listening, you got to understand that you don't have to know, and, you know, you don't have to have some thorough knowledge of this area. You're going to have a chance to learn and then figure out, you know, it's going to provide you opportunities to uh, figure out how to, to talk about what's, what's going on in there. So just like the, example you gave, which I think is so cool. So uh, good stuff. Thank <laughs> uh, you. You're welcome. The, uh, uh, you know, Catherine, you do speaking engagements, Q&A sessions and appearances. How does a listener go about reaching out to you to set up one of these types of events? So I have a website, www.catherinemarsh.com. Um, and I have information there um, for how anyone could reach me. And I'm very free with my email. Um, it's available there. And I encourage um, educators to reach out who want to, you know, use the book in the classroom, who would like to have me visit. Um, you know, that's something I'm very receptive to. And I love, love, love getting uh, emails from young people. Um, and that's something that I, I tell kids, you know, write me when you figure out in the book what the secret is that, you know, Matthew, can you figure it out before Matthew? If so, tell me the page. Do you figure it out with Matthew? And that's always fun hearing from kids and hearing sort of when they sort of clued into what's going on in the book. That's awesome. I like that. That's, a, that's very cool. That'd, that'd be a neat way of, uh, uh, of uh, the kids learning about the story and following along and being excited about pushing forward, I guess is my point to find out uh, what Matthew knows, what he knows what's going on. I, wait a second. I got to catch up right. to him right over. So I, I love that. <laughs> awesome stuff. So if someone wanted to follow and connect with you, are you on social media? Do you have places like I that? Am. Yes. So I have a Twitter account, which I'm keeping for now. We'll see. <laughs> and then I also am on Instagram. Um, and uh, I have a Facebook as well. That's an author page. But the best way really to reach me is the email. And I like direct. Um, I like direct contact. I always think it's it's the most interesting. And that's nighttourist at gmail.com. Very cool. Well, I'll put that information in the show notes. So it's right there where they can click on it and go uh connect with you. So awesome stuff. Uh, Catherine, I got two last questions before you go. And uh, they're general questions I like to ask my guests and hear what, uh, uh, how they go about talking about this stuff. So the first one is, how do you keep going when so much is going on that you may want to quit? That is a wonderful question. Um, I think what I always tell kids, I love talking to kids about writing. That's one of my favorite things to do, not only because I was a teacher for a very short time, I wouldn't count myself as a teacher, but because I was also an editor and a reporter and a fiction writer, writing is like my life's blood, right? So I love talking to kids. And I always say to kids, I love to ask them, how many of you like writing? And some, there are always a few raising, how many of you don't like writing? And then most of them raise their hand, right? And I always like to say, just because you don't like writing, I'm going to tell you a secret. There are a lot of days I don't like writing. <laughs> and I was like, a lot of days. And not liking writing doesn't make you not a writer. Forgive all my double negatives there. But what I'm trying to say is that 
what makes you a writer, and I always say this to kids, is rewriting. It's going back, it's revising, um, and it's caring about what you have to say in written form. And if you care and you read, you know, and you sort of go back to what you did and try again, that makes you a writer. So you don't have to be good to be a writer. You don't have to be really good at writing. Um, And that's how I feel when you ask that question. I feel like there are a lot of days I don't feel good about my writing. Um, And how I keep going on is I tell myself, it's the journey. It's the process. It's the revision. That's what makes you a writer, not just a first draft. Love that. Thank you so much. Uh, Last question. Do you have a teacher in your past who made a difference in your life? If so, who was it? And what would you say if given the chance to say thank you? Yes, Kenneth Hubner, who is my English teacher in both seventh and uh, ninth grade um, at the Ethical Culture School in in Riverdale in the Bronx, um, was wonderful. He was an English teacher who had us read just especially for the time and not to date myself, but this was, you know, in the like the 80s. um, He had us read a wonderful wide selection of work by all sorts of different authors of different identities. Um, He just had, he had pictures on his wall of all his favorite writers. There were like tons of them. Um, And he just had such enthusiasm for books and writing that he made me love it along with him. So I'm, I will always be grateful to him for just being a fantastic English teacher. That is so awesome. I love it. Uh, Catherine, thanks so much for talking with me today. The Lost Year is a powerful journey to help young people learn and understand and at the same time solve that mystery, have fun, and uh, enjoy reading and maybe even think about becoming a writer, which I love. Uh, Wishing you success in everything you do. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me. Hey, you have been listening to Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12, a podcast to help you help kids achieve their dreams. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the podcast network based in Canada called Voice Ed Radio. Voice Ed Radio, your voice is right. The opinions expressed on Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 are those of the guests and hosts. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is intended to share ideas, advice, and suggestions. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is produced for educational purposes. Hey, thanks for listening. It would be awesome if you visited my website at stephenmaletto.com and connected with me, left a review, and listened to more episodes. And by the way, you could also share it with your friends, with your family, and uh, your colleagues. Thanks so much. You're awesome.